Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for, to the organisers for letting me give this talk and uh, for bumping me up as well. I feel very honoured. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm Ben. I'm a medical physicist from Blue Earth Therapeutics, um, and I'm just going to give a little overview on on our view on CAT space. Uh, first off, quick disclaimer. Yeah, I'm an employee of Blue Earth Therapeutics, and we're a company developing therapeutic radio pharmaceuticals. So I'm going to try and give a, a slightly different perspective to the ones that, that you've seen just to avoid too much repetition for you guys. Uh, but just as a quick overview of, of what, I'll, what I'll run over, I'll start with a bit of background on, on Blue Earth. Um, I know we don't have the biggest footprint, so useful bit of introduction to us. Uh, I'll touch on our main molecule in our pipeline. Then I'll go into some specifics on, on Alpha, in particular, Actinium-225 as we see it, including some, some modeling we've done based on uh, patient data that we've got from our other molecules. Um, and then I'll finish on on our areas of interest in terms of metrology and, and what we think this space can really do for not just us as a company, but for, for the industry as a whole, uh, and then some concluding remarks. So just quickly on, on Blue Earth. Uh, so Blue Earth is a family of two companies. Our sister companies, Blue Earth Diagnostics, they were established in 2014. Uh, they're a commercial stage diagnostics company. So products like Posluma and, and Axiomen. And they were acquired by, by Braco, our parent company, in, in 2019. And then we were established Blue Earth Therapeutics in, in 2021. And you can see our mission statement there, but really the, the primary aim was to, to translate what we'd done in, in the diagnostic space uh, with those molecules into the therapeutic space, because we thought uh, some of the properties that we saw in those molecules had some real potential in the therapeutic space. And we've got phase one and two trials both underway and, and planned. Um, so you saw me mention uh, this RH PSMA, radio hybrid PSMA. So just give a, a little bit of background on, on what I mean when I say that. Um, I won't preach to the choir about what PSMA is, highly expressed um, antigen and prostate, prostate cancer, really good targeting mechanism. Um, but this radio hybrid radio, radio pharmaceutical that we, was developed with our colleagues at, at the Technical University of of Munich um, was developed to have this low kidney uptake, rapid blood clearance and high accumulation in tumors. And we think it's those three properties that, that make it really tantalizing for potential translation into, into the therapeutic space. Um, the thing that makes it the, the radio hybrid part that, that we refer to, it's really just talking about this metal chelate combined with the silicon fluoride acceptor. So it's a slightly different uh, view, different way of achieving what Dr. Schultz spoke about earlier getting this, this theranostic pair. So um, the silicon fluoride acceptor obviously gives a, a binding, binding uh, opportunity for diagnostic radioisotopes like fluorine 18. And then metal chelate lets us bind these therapeutic heavy metals. So lutetium and actinium. Um, and it's this, this sort of property that makes that we, is why we call it this true theranostic agent. So minimal chemical changes between the diagnostic and the therapeutic versions of this molecule. Um, and labelled with lutetium, uh, we've seen effective tumour suppression and some really promising efficacy in, in patients uh, so far. You can see a couple of references there. Um, but I thought I'd start with with some example tumour time activity curves. I am a I'm a physicist, so you shouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of graphs in this in this in this talk. Um, and this is really where we're focusing a lot of our attention as Blue Earth. These comparisons in the tumour uptake, the, the comparisons in uptake of the radio pharmaceutical between tumor and normal tissue. So we're really focusing on, on efficacy versus toxicity. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is, is this difference in proportion of dose contribution at later time points. So we've sort of identified this slightly arbitrary four day cutoff, um, but, but the key message is that beyond these, this time at these later time points, you've got a real significant difference in the proportion of dose that's delivered to the tumor versus in this case, the kidney or, or healthy organ. And what that means is that these later time points, your therapeutic index is, is vastly improved. Um, that's obviously in the, in the lutetium setting, but the, re the relevance is that it really translates well to, to an alpha emitter. And, and for us, that's actinium-225. So just to, just to talk you through what, what you're seeing here, the, the effect of, of transferring the, the, the radioisotope used from lutetium-177 to actinium-225 um, is this even greater 
improvement in therapeutic index at later time points. And that's what you're seeing. And that's what you'd expect intuitively from the longer half-life of Actinium-225, right? Because at these later time points, Actinium-225 is continuing to deliver dose, but most of that dose is going to the tumor because in the healthy organ, like, like the kidney, most of the radiopharmaceutical is already washed out, okay? Now, those of you with very good, good eyesight will spot at the bottom here that this is some modeling that we've done, assuming changing the luticium radioisotope for an actinium, and we're ignored, ignoring the translocation of free daughters. And you see this a lot. Um, and that kind of brings us on to something that a lot of people have talked about already and area of huge interest for us as Blue Earth, which is this, assess this assessment and analysis of, you know, what's going on with these actinium-225 daughters. So, you know, as, as has been mentioned, a long complex decay chain uh, with lots of daughters for, for an average of four alpha, alpha emissions. Um, and, and this is where, you know, we have this challenge in, in metrology and, and medical physics, which is trying to assess the impact on, on, for us, what we're really concerned about, which is the therapeutic index of the translocation of those daughters. We generally talk about Frankum and Bismuth, they're the two longest lived in the decay chain, and they're the ones that we can detect with those gammas at 440 and 218 keV. Um, and we want to find out, we, we want to identify how can we characterize the impact on therapeutic index and how can we account for it in dosimetry. There's some really good good work that's been done out there. There's people have spoken about novel counting techniques for radioactive blood samples, uh, multi-energy window dosimetry. Uh, George Skoros has done some nice stuff with this, um, separating the Frankium emissions from the bismuth emissions and treating the Frankium emission as a true analog of the actinium, while the bismuth is the daughter that's being translocated. For our part, we've, again, tried to do some modeling to see, see what the impact would be. So we've come up with this sort of imaginary value we've called seed rate, which is just the proportion of tumor-bound actinium decays that lead to bismuth-213 free in plasma, okay? And the important point that, that we think, without looking too, too much at the exact numbers, because there's a lot of caveats and, and assumptions that go into this, is just the scale of the change that you get as this seed rate goes up. So it shows how important it is, A, to identify what this, this seed rate might be, and B, to minimize it as much as you possibly can. And when you see the scale of that change, the, the automatic question, which I think Dr. Schultz and, and others have, have looked at, is, well, why wouldn't you just use a, a radioisotope with a simpler decay chain or shorter-lived daughters to avoid this problem altogether? Um, and that's a really valid question. And, and one of the other candidates that, that lots of other com companies are looking at is LED212 for this exact reason. For our molecule, because uh, we looked at the same thing, um, we think there's, there's a good reason not, not to do this. So... This is an example, again, some modeling, trans, trans, uh, exchanging the, the actinium-225 for a lead-212 radioisotope. Um, what you see is this really significant drop-off in, in dose of the tumor, which is what you'd expect, right? It's the shorter half-life. It's just delivering dose over a much shorter time. Um, but what's important is this isn't reflected in the, the drop-off in dose for the normal organ like the kidney. So what that means once you, once you put all that through is that you get this really significant drop in therapeutic index, okay? Um, and that's for that's obviously for our, our molecule. So for PK that matches what, what we're seeing in our molecule, um, in the dosimetry we've done so far, this, this doesn't necessarily make sense because although it would be great to use a radionuclide with a simpler decay chain and, and shorter lived daughters, you have to balance this with using a radioisotope whose physical half-life matches the biological half-life in the tumor. Okay, you want to maximize that dose delivery, dose delivery to the tumor. <clears throat> I think all that modeling is really nice because it leads us on quite nicely to, to what, what we're really here, all here for, which is why it's so important to do dosimetry and targeted alpha therapy. So, you know, all this is, is, is modeling and caveats and assumptions. And really what we want to do is, is confirm this with measurement, measurement in dosimetry, measurement in radioactive blood samples, et cetera. So we want to confirm the PK that, that we're, sort of assuming and, and modeling. And then we want to start to try and quantify the impact of translocation of those daughters. So from actinium-225, we're, we're really talking about bismuth, but also the frankium. Um, we know this is difficult with actinium, super low radio, radioactivities used, um, low gamma yields. But is that a reason to switch the, radio, the radionuclide? We think clearly not. You know, that, that's our challenge as physicists, metrologists, all of us is to resolve these challenges and issues around dosimetry and measuring these things, but we should focus on using, you know, the optimal radionuclide for therapeutic efficacy. 
Um, for a ready pharma company, there's there's regulatory perspectives. It's it's really helpful for us to demonstrate PK repeatability across radionuclides. And then I think one that that uh, Professor Vorster um, touched on is correlating these observed toxicities with absorbed dose, so that hopefully we can get normal organ dose limits that are more appropriate to to us in radio in RPT radio pharmaceutical therapy and particularly in alpha therapy. Um, quick aside, just just our view on on you know, what standards and, that we have in targeted alpha therapy and GAPS. And I thought it's was, it was quite interesting because, you know, we have quite a good standard and agreement on, on you know, dose calculations for alphas. So MERD pamphlet number 22, what to do when we have the cumulative activity data. But we've got GAPS in all these areas that have, have already been discussed, so I won't rake over them again. And in some ways, it's a little bit backwards, right? We, we know what to do when we get the data, but we don't necessarily know how to get the data <laughs> in a consistent and reliable manner. Um, so these are some areas that we think are really, really useful. Actually, the, the most recent EANM guidelines on uh, first in human dosimetry is, is really handy and has some really interesting points and actually does specifically to talk about accounting for uh, the pharmacokinetics of daughters. So I think it's a really good step. And actually, we're, we're making really good progress on all of this at the moment. But that is why you know we as a company are really interested in supporting all this research. Um, helping where we can, and we think there's a big opportunity with our with our alpha pipeline and actinium to support in doing this. Um, you know, I've highlighted these these three areas uh, in which we're involved, and we'd like to continue being involved and be more involved because um, they really make a massive difference in our ability to develop uh, these effective radio pharmaceuticals for therapy. So, just to finish up again, you know, we're really keen to support scientific development in these areas uh, relating to alpha emitting radio pharmaceuticals. Um, I've highlighted these three areas of interest, but by all means, you know, we're, we're open to, to hearing many other areas of collaboration. We are already working towards uh, these goals with, with several ongoing projects that I've listed there. Um, and, and we hope to continue to do so for, for a long time. And, and yeah, I think that's all I've got time for. Uh, Actually, I've, I've run through it a bit quicker, but thank you very much for your time. Happy to take questions or you can email me. Thank you. Yeah.